I'm Jason Schwartz, and we're here on Dream Makers, Mama Presents. The Maui Arts and Music Association has a really great pleasure today. I'm here with Ariel, who you know, and John DeRyder. John DeRyder is here from? Edmonton, Edmonton, Canada. Edmonton, Canada. Coming all the way to Maui for more than just a vacation you're going to find. John, um, rather than me telling these folks out there who you are, maybe you can give... Uh, these people want to hear of who you are and why you're here. Take it from there. I'm here, just a, an invitation from the last time in February of uh, just being with people, talking about what is true, what isn't true, what life is, what it isn't, and how to be. How to be, that's an interesting so how would you say how to be happens? How do you be? How do you be? <laughs> how do you be? <laughs> um, by living in a space where one isn't trying to be something, um, not trying to be a somebody, uh, trying to maintain something, but just being comfortable with being a nobody that that has nothing and there's no identity to maintain, mm -hmm. um, not an ego to protect, um, just being comfortable with the simplicity of just living and not, not, making the, not making the shallow deep. That all sounds great, but it also sounds really tricky and how to get there. I mean, how do we control these egos and um, our tremendous desires that so many people have, especially in this Western world? And how do we get to that point where we're just wanting to be nothing? How does one get there? Not by wanting to be nothing or wanting to be but by letting go, letting go of everything that we've ever learned, letting go of our beliefs, letting go of our morals, our internal psychological structure, letting go of everything that holds us together, that defines who we are. So it's not using our career to identify what we are or who we are then a career is just something that we do and it's something that's wonderfully shallow and we're not making it more profound than that so we, we're not a somebody in it. Now I don't know how many of you out there, well, he just said uh, living and having a career that's wonderfully shallow. Now that, you know, that's an interesting concept. John is here because a number of people, from what I'm understanding, found what he was saying to be very profound and moving them toward more awareness of themselves and their concept of just being, of not, see how I'm doing. They wanted to understand how you're able to live your flyers, live, your, live in truth, live your truth. And the words that you speak have been shared with people. We are coming back again, I know, later in the year. People are here to um, more than enjoy your words to experience you as a being, 
and to experience your words in a way, some would say, like a guru. I know that you're saying, here, I'm not here with any message that isn't just an expression of the truth. Um, how do you define uh, what you're doing with people here? Are you here to teach them a specific message, or are you here to let them ask you questions and such? I'm trying to come to grips with it. When I, um, I have experienced you in the past meeting you, very nice guy, you, you know, go out on the beach and take a swim like everyone else, and you have a whole life and a family back uh, in Canada. So uh, many would say this sounds like a great paid vacation to come to Maui and have an experience with some people. Well, I think it's terrific. And um, so I'd like to somehow get a feeling for um, what it is that you're here for. I mean, I know you're, you're trying to share something. If, are you trying to teach or are you trying to be available so people glean whatever is important to them? I'm trying to come to the concept of what it is that you're teaching. Is it truth in general, someone's own truth, um, experience an environment that there's something that can raise up in them to be more full in who they are? How's that for a real straight question? <laughs> it's, what I'm doing is occupying a space that is really completely different from anything that defines, that's definable in society. It's, it's not a space defined by any, any kind of familiar comfort, but it's a space that, it's a space that we all come from as a being. It's the same kind of space that, that you see in, in uh, a little baby that is uncluttered by learning and ideas and norms and what ought to be and what could be and what should be and what was that shouldn't have been and what was that I wish was different. Um, what I'm really saying, like I'm looking out here and I'm thinking that my audience, or our audience, is wondering why are you here with us on TV? You're here to express because we brought you here, right, to our show, who you are and why you're here. And, and somehow, the next time that John is here, we'd like to have people come and see you and share um, with you. I'm sure that there's uh, so many different cultures and ideas on this island, and an audience that uh, comes from so many different places. Like you say, you're sharing something that isn't uh, conventional, where there's lots of uh, attachment and deepness tied to things that are shallow, things that are relatively unimportant in the scope of where truth lies. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you, um, do you uh, meditate? Do you do anything differently about life than others? Or uh, No, I don't meditate. I just completely live life. Um, but I live in a space that is, it's, it's not a space that's seen, it's not a space that you can hear, it's not a space that you can touch. Um, it's seeing uh, the insides of people, seeing who they really are and bypassing the personality, not, not being in relationship with the person's personality, but meeting them. valuing them, loving them, and all of their stuff then is just bypasses, and it's not in the way. It's so not being a personality that's interacting with another personality. It's a being that's recognizing another being beneath all of the personal constructs, personality. So actually, I think what you're saying is that you're seeing the, the higher person, the higher God in each person and bypassing the personal, the personality and the shallow is the word that I know you like to use and I enjoy that as well. So when, 
when he's talking about the shallow, it doesn't mean what we would generally think is shallow, which is we would go, oh, well, that's very shallow. But when John is teaching, at least my experience of him has been when he's talking about the shallow, that the shallow for his teaching basically means that everything it is not important. This whole existence. This whole existence, you know, it, it's really not important. It's all just opportunities for us to have experiences and grow in our lives and who we are to, rec to recognize, to come to remember and recognize who we are. Is that? But this whole existence is just a, a playground of expression for you as a being mm -hmm. instead of a, an existence where um, a person of as an ego is there to, to conquer and to control and to get what they need and get what they want. Well, I, I really do understand what you're saying because I've spent really my whole lifetime and consciously the past 20 years devoted to this type of work. So I, I have an understanding of that. And for myself, I know when I've tried to move beyond personalities and lose all the personalities and who I think I am, it's been a really interesting experience, and I've come to a place, even now, where somebody says, who are you? And I go, well, yeah, I'm, I'm really nothing and nobody, you know, <laughs> except that I'm God, you know, that higher self within me. So I think that for a lot of people like yourselves out there, that's a pretty difficult concept to understand in a five-minute conversation. but. I know John has worked really um, also a long time with getting to where you are. So why don't you, if you would, give us a little bit of background in how you came to these understandings and what your process was to get to the point where you are now. You know, I know you've spent a lot of years and I know you, you have a family too that so you've had a different life you've had a different kind of life as well so could you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are in, in the back and the time period behind you well it started about 20 years ago um, where I got a taste of um, like, a, like an internal awakening and it lasted for about a year, and uh, it was just the most incredible newness inside that I wasn't looking for. I didn't know that it ever existed. Um, I wasn't wanting it, it just happened. And then once I tasted it and lived in that for a year and it left, then I had to find out what is what is the source of that. What was that like, that internal awakening? How did, how did you recognize it? as an internal awakening? It was experiencing a, a, a flow of joy and enjoyment that wasn't based on anything on the outside. Uh, it wasn't based on doing something or trying something or doing the fun thing. Uh, it wasn't based on anything in my life. It, it's something that originated on the inside and it just kept growing. It's like these flowers would just bloom from nothing uh, from the inside out and then it would show on the outside um, and it never occurred to me that something like that would ever end once it had started and it's like well this is utterly new mm -hmm. and it's you don't have to do anything wow that sounds really beautiful as you were saying it my heart was going yes I'm blossoming flowers <laughs> And after a year, when it left, which was a tremendous surprise. I can imagine. Um, then I became very miserable because without having that, life wasn't worth living. I knew that that held the meaning of life. That, that's why we're here. But once it was gone, it's like, well, what was it? Where did it come from? What is, what's the source? What is, what is truth? Um, how do you find it? 
So I ended up doing everything I could on the inside to find that, which was like turning myself inside out mentally and emotionally. And went to an incredible depth inside to try and uncover that source, and I couldn't find it, which was very disconcerting. It was extremely, extremely painful. Um, a lot of agony, a lot of darkness. And um, after about two years, I let go of needing for that to change. It's a big one, isn't it? So I basically made my home on the inside in the midst of um, pain and suffering and darkness, uh, the absence of light, uh, not being happy, being tormented, and, and having lost something that was um, like any, any value of, um, like an eternal value allowed myself to be unconditionally content with not having it, not ever getting it, and having its, its worst replacement. Darkness and unhappiness and discontentedness and being lost. That's pretty hard to do. I mean, it has been for me. So I, I really honor your ability to do that. Did, was it, I mean, you just stepped into it and said, it's okay. I, I, in a very warm and tender way, I just let all of that be okay forever. And it was a, a genuine letting go of ever needing to get it back, ever needing to be happy. And to my complete surprise, um, it was like a a return of that flower that just responded and just came right out from within that, that dark and painful place. And it was a surprise because I wasn't expecting it. I was letting it go for good. But there was no thought of maybe doing this, I'll get it back. What was happening on the outside? I mean, from my understanding, that uh, search was a deep search mm -hmm. versus a shallow. But what was happening in the shallow world when you're going through that kind of deep? Just uh, working, spending time with people. Although when I would spend time with people, the only thing I was interested in talking about was, was the search, talking about truth, what it is, what it isn't. Just working and living life, but on the inside, these these huge wheels were constantly turning and digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and there was there was no stopping. What got you? It. What got you into this position where um, people, obviously, for you being here, people have been so moved through conversation with you and through uh, interaction with you that they're drawn to you tell them, I'm sure you didn't have anyone guide you in your uh, search for this piece? Or is this... I looked, so, and I wished, but I couldn't find anything or anybody. Is that part of your motivation in you know, the middle of motivation? Is that part of how this developed? I'm wondering how it so developed that um, people have given you this uh, ability to speak your truth and I mean, you've got, it sounds like a great job. It sounds funny, but to have someone fly it to Maui three times a year to talk to a group of people, um, I imagine for public consumption, and maybe another question, where when uh, someone has no awareness of where you're coming from or has not been any kind of search for their lifetime, they may or may not understand how someone gets to uh, where you are now, which is you're here and speaking to people and, and uh, interacting with them in such a way that they want to share with you. And it's uh, not a word. I think the word is uh, you have devotees. You have people that 
are recognizing that you are a vehicle for them to find their own truth? Is that what's happening? How did that happen? That started uh, 11 years ago and has slowly grown uh, and developed. So now I'm traveling more and so on, but it's still uh, just being with people. And there's, not, there's not an agenda or a form. Uh, I don't prepare for any meetings. I don't study and read and uh, put a script together. Just show up and do what I do. So you were interacting with people, and more people were coming, and they started taping you, and they started saying, "Come on, John, come to this." And that kind of a thing kind of grew out of uh, interactions with people. Is that what you I understand you have a quite a large group of people in Canada where you live that have come there to be with you, to be. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that John does that's really very beautiful is that he does sit and he just bees with you. And so there is no conversation in that part. At least that's what I've experienced with you. Um, and, and that's a very unusual thing to do um, for someone to be able to hold that kind of audience where Nobody's saying anything. You know, to it looks rather, it, it's, it's rather humorous on the surface. Yes, it is on the surface. One of the first meetings in another city, Calgary, uh, first two hours, there was nothing spoken, nothing said, nothing qualified. Um, just sitting there and I was just connecting with people as a being, meeting other beings. And there were, it was a group of about 100 people that had been there for the first time. But it was interesting to just watch that because 100 people are sitting there completely quiet. They're not fidgeting. They're yes. not scratching themselves. They're not getting up, going to the washroom. They're not leaving. They're just sitting there uh, completely, utterly and completely there, and yet nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's a strange thing to see because what's What's happening then that, that, that people aren't getting frustrated that they're not leaving? Well, you know, when, when you say nothing's happening, nothing's happening to, uh, for our human personalities, I think a lot is happening. Mm -hmm. um, John has an incredible sense and power of love as he sits there. And he ha also has these beautiful, incredible eyes that move across the audience and connect with different people. And as he does that, people are very touched many times in their hearts and who they are. So that's part of that being that's not, no words are spoken, and yet a lot is happening. There's a lot that's happening. Right. <laughs> inside for people. Um, what I'm doing in that, that silent time gazing at people is what it looks at, is, is what it looks like. For myself, there's, it's like I come out as a being, I come out of my body, and it's there's a, it's like a ballet, and I'll, I'll move, I'll, I'll connect with different people, and at first it's like moving toward them, uh, it's like a dance or a ballet moving toward them, and at first just, as it were, laying down at their doorstep, um, and not doing anything, not knocking on their door, not calling them out, not addressing them, just laying on their doorstep. And what that does is it causes a pull, a non-threatening pull, where that person will end up, who they really are, ends up taking a peek out of the door, mm -hmm. and they still discover that it's, it's non-threatening, so they end up coming out, and then we end up, as two beings, just seeing each other, not two people looking at each other, but two beings seeing each other. And the reality of that is uh, extremely powerful. It really is. I've experienced it. So do you believe, I mean, this is how I see it, do you believe that as you sit in this space, that actually you elevate the consciousness mm -hmm. 
of the beings that are in the room with you to a level where they can um, see and feel at a higher state of being than what they, how they normally walk around? That, how that it's, it really shifts. The whole space of the room can, can change. So people can experience like um, altered states mm -hmm. in that uh, time where it looks like nothing's happening. Um, or they, they can be going through things that to them is like, even if they've never been on drugs before or something, to them it's like, well, it's like drugs. It's like something's happening inside. Things are opening up inside and they're experiencing things. They're, they're seeing things. Uh, that they've never experienced or seen in their whole life, and yet on the surface, nothing's happening. So for people, that can be quite powerful and, and really astonishing. It, it really is astonishing. You know, I, um, I was personally blown away the first time I came and sat with you and saw that people were, they were fine with that. Like you said, this group sat there for two hours and didn't move. And that's um, a very powerful space to be able to hold with so many human beings whom a lot of them have no understanding of that place at all. Well, they had no idea what they were expecting a lecture. Right. <laughs> and nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. So the, the tension was, the tension was incredible. That. It's like the whole place was just there, and and not a word, not a noise, and yet nobody nobody left because something something really powerful was happening. They were experiencing something, and yet for their minds, nothing's happening. So that makes it even bigger for them because now there's it, it doesn't make any sense. It's really huge, and yet it's nothing. So how, how do you believe you get to this place where you're able to raise that energy and uplift these people to be able to have that kind of communication where there is no words being spoken? Do you believe that this is God coming through you or your God coming through you? Or how does, how does God or what many people consider to be their higher powers how does that play into this? It's, 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 for myself, it's like just being reality. And you can't be reality if you're living inside of something that isn't quite true. If you're living inside of an ego or if you, or if you have different identities that you're always protecting and feeding and managing. If, if you're living to cope and control or if you're content to live and to be in the same way that um, that a little baby is, not not holding itself together, not sustaining itself on the inside, but just completely being present, and that allows them to flow out. So you don't believe that it's anything else other than just your own ability to be present that enables you to do this. Did you see the show Cocoon? Yes, I did. I loved it. There's that scene where the alien woman gets into the swimming pool and there's another man. They're separated from about um, 30, or 40, 30 or 40 feet. With? Standing in the water. And she told him to just stay there. He wanted to come to her. And she said, just stay there. And then you could, you could see all this energy move out of her. She basically came out of herself, and there's this incredible flow that basically picked him up of who he is on the inside, and they started to have this interchange based on what she was doing. Um, when I saw that movie and I saw that scene, I found it absolutely incredible because that, when I'm connecting with individuals, that's what I'm doing. Only on the on the uh, on the movie screen, you could you could see it. Right. Well, but it's, it's the same thing that's happening, and people end up seeing, seeing what is seen in that movie in terms of the colors and the energy, and visually seeing it, and the whole room changes, and they're watching the color flow through the space in between, and they're watching it flow toward other people, and they're seeing things that to them it's like that they're on drugs or something, and yet they've they've never been on drugs before, 
and they're, they're experiencing a reality and they're watching unseen stuff happen. When, uh, when you're not in their presence, have you uh, had any reactions of how people's lives are changed? Do they use some of the, or become some of the things that you've shared with them in your uh, audience? In other words, uh, to go to uh, someone, have a wonderful experience, and then leave there and be lacking and wanting for them is one thing. The other thing is having gotten something and embracing it into their own beingness to now live in a more truthful, communicating way. Have you had much? People get it. They do. That they end up letting go of their whole persona, letting go of their belief systems, their religious learning, their psychological learning, everything that they've learned and taken in over many, many years to try and hold oneself together on the inside and just letting all of that go, letting all of the internal learning, just letting it all go. And it's at first it, it seems very, very threatening to a person because immediately you think, well, if I let go of everything that's holding me together on the inside, if I let go of that safety net that I'm keeping underneath me so that I don't just fall through into, into nothing, if I let go of all of that, what will happen to me? Where, where, where will I end up? What will I turn into? And that can be terrifying for people because it's like going into the abyss or going into an unknown. That there's nothing familiar about it. But people do it. And they find out that when... It, it, at first, for the mind, it's like you're going to fall into a huge, bottomless, dark hole, and they'll, once they fall in, they'll never be able to get out of it. And when they let go of everything that holds them together, and, and to their mind, it seems like they're falling into this dark hole. What they end up falling into is like a, a, a pure, liquid, moving form of, of unconditional love, and they're astonished that that was always there, and they were scared to go there. That it's not dark, it's not some strange death that will happen inside that they can't reverse. Uh, but they end up discovering what they really are and where the nourishment really comes from. So, I think what I'm, from what you're saying, so yes, once you come in, you're finding that the people that are sharing with you are taking going this plan, getting to that place more. But these people that, that come to Canada to be with you and, and stay with you, I know you have quite a group there that have been with you for years, right? Um, do, do they eventually, have you seen them come to the same place as you? Where have you seen them move to in their levels of advancement or? Living through. There's many that really begin to go home going home in terms of going into that space of being that, that they had when they were a baby or when they were a little child and basically walked out of that space to get something that, that, that a person perceives they need or living, living according to wants or needs instead of what is already there, that there's um, a lot of people that really go back to that space there's fewer that go really deep into that space, and there's very few that utterly and completely and unreservedly go into that space. I can appreciate that. If I, I, like I said, I've worked on it for a lot of years, and I know for myself, each time I've let go of another layer of who it is that I think I am, it's it's a terrifying space because all of a sudden you're left there going, well, I'm nothing, you know, and there's nothing that holds those pieces together of everything that we've built up to know who we are. So and yet the pieces that we hold together to define who we are, it's, it's the holding of those pieces together that burns us out on the inside. We, we can't. We can't live with ourselves. Right. And 
then others can't live with us either because we're doing something inside that they can't be comfortable with. So it, it's, we're doing it to make it work and, and, and to try and live, and yet that's what removes us from being able to have what we're wanting. We, we can't live then. We can't be with other people. So those few people that you say that really have gotten, gotten it, what do you think? There's, there's, there's many that have really gotten it. There's few that have gone. That have completely disappeared in that, that space. Which is a whole lot bigger than just getting it. Yes, I understand. So I'd like to just go back to what going home means to you, you know, going back to that term going home, because we've, we've all seen it in so many different places, you know, I mean, I think to a lot of people, the whole spiritual idea of going home is going somewhere out there, you know, I, I want to go home, it means I want to get out of here, so. The going home, we, 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 live, we live our lives in a sense, in this home away from home, and this home away from home is living a life based on wants and needs. So we're always living projected forward or projected out, um, believing that if we get that new car, then there'll be that satisfaction of being that I'm looking for, that nothing else is, is touching that yet. So a, a new car, that'll do it. And as soon as you get the new car, it's, it's fast gone, and then we forget that that didn't work. And as soon as we forget that that didn't work, at the same time, we're out reaching for the, the next new thing a new relationship, a, a, a new love, and none of it gives people what they're looking for. It's like the, the single greatest source of happiness that people turn to is uh, relationships, being in love, looking for love, mm -hmm. and everybody's doing it, and yet at the same time, the single greatest source of grief and pain and suffering in the world is because of breaking relationships that aren't satisfying. It's so what is it you think they are looking for? What is it that you think on that deeper level that they are looking intimacy for? Intimacy of being. And looking for that intimacy of being on the outside. Or looking for that intimacy of being uh, from an emotional source or a physical source or a mental source. That satisfaction of being. Where there's nothing that can satisfy you as a being if it's not the beingness that you're in. Mental satisfaction only goes so deep. Emotional satisfaction only goes so deep. And it's but never it, really satisfying. It, and it doesn't satisfy our It being. doesn't last very long, let's yeah. put it that way. So we're out constantly grabbing at wanting to be happy wanting peace, wanting joy, wanting enjoyment to touch deep inside, and at the same, try, at the same time trying to get rid of the pain and the covering and the grief and the agony, instead of letting go of needing to be happy, letting go of needing to push away the pain and get it out. The happiest person is, is that individual that is unconditionally and permanently content without ever needing to be happy. Which is what you said you did. That's a happy person. And it's not in a fatalistic way of, I don't need to be happy. Uh, it's like the fox um, turning away from the grapes because he can't get them out of the tree, um, saying that, well, he doesn't like grapes anyway and walks away. It's, it's a, a very tender, lovely letting go of ever needing to have it, of ever needing to be happy of ever needing to get rid of the pain. And that allows oneself to be quieted on the inside and to be gentled on the inside. And instead of there being a clutching and a needing and a wanting and a having, there's a letting go which allows there to be an opening and a softening. And it's that openness and that softness in the midst of joy or pain that satisfies you as a being. It's not the having of anything that satisfies. 
this is a kind of a subject, trying to put it into an analytical framework is uh, contrary to its, uh, it, it's difficult to describe it because it's not the kind of thing that needs to be described, it needs to be experienced, I would think. Um, and it is experienced. When you hold a little baby, you see it. There's, there's, there's a flow, when you look in their eyes, when you look in their face, there's this flow coming out. And what that flow tells you is that they're not containing themselves. They're not holding themselves together. They're not forming an identity or, or a little child. They're not being somebody that has something. In the most wonderful way, they're a nobody that has absolutely nothing. So then they're unencumbered on the inside. They're free. And what's left is just a flow of expression. Every, the only thing that they're expressing is what they already are and what they already have. And that there's nothing on the outside that they need to get something on the inside. So all there is is what's already on the inside just expressing out and flowing out. You haven't been here um, continuously. In my last 10 years, just to give you a reference point, we've been very fortunate in Maui to find that there are many enlightened, open and loving and giving beings that have been here and been sharing, not identically in the way that you have, but have had groups of people that have uh, gathered around them to feel their beingness and to experience it in a different way. Um, are you, I don't think, are you unique in what you do? Is there some generality of path that can, that can, um, be likened to others that have been bringing this kind of a truth? Or is this something um, unique about what you're doing? Trying to identify, um, for example, there's uh, Gangaji, who many people see on TV here. There's a lady who became enlightened, and many people come to share with her and ask her questions similar to um, what you've done. And yet, you hold a different thing. Many of the people I've seen in your audience have been followers or devotees, not that you're in any way putting yourself as a guru, but many people are looking to you for those answers, and I'm looking to see, I can sense in you, you like the idea that people get it and go out into the world and are living it. What is it that, I don't know if this is a question or just an asking you to explore, what is it about what you do that is uh, most meaningful to you. I mean, you come here, not on vacation. People bring you here because uh, they want to hear what, what you can say and be with them. What do you bring that, uh, that our audience out here can come see you next time and feel, yeah, that was really a worthwhile thing. I really am feeling my life enriched through this. When I, when I come here, the only reason I come is because of invitation. Right. Um, if the invitation wasn't there, I, just, I wouldn't go. But then I would do whatever it is that I, I do otherwise. And the capacity to connect with people, that capacity is completely alive, so that, that's taking place toward everything else in the universe. So I don't need a person to connect with for that to be there. So I'll respond to being with people or I'll respond to being with whatever it is that is presently there. Well, there's so many questions I want to ask John. You know I mean? Uh, well, I'm trying not to well, as I'm, keep I'm jumping in here. But I'm listening and <laughs> trying to understand. In other words, I'm, yesterday we were sitting here with a small group for media. And I think I was put in aware, maybe you should interview me. Aware of, because what I get in the message is, it's uh, your being with others is suddenly getting them to be. Being is not a news kind of a thing. Doing action is the news sort of follows the action of events. And this is a non-event of something that is really um, contrary, unique 
It is uh, clearly stepping out of creating importance to a world of all kinds of activity and all kinds of dreams and aspirations people have. And um, we're now um, bringing to them an experience of coming to an event of something's going to happen where nothing may happen. I'm, uh, through this whole thing, I've been laboring to try to understand how to clearly let our audience understand uh, you in the sense of what are you trying to accomplish or what are others hoping to have from you here? But what I'm trying to accomplish is nothing. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not here to help people or to get people enlightened uh, or to make people comfortable because what I, as soon as I start spending time with people, what will happen is that it will completely ruin their life. It doesn't put it together. It doesn't help them. It doesn't heal them um, because all of the illusion is taken apart. The lies are torn down and they fall apart and all that is left over when all of that is gone is just themselves. And all of the structure fallen off. So there's a sense of incredible vulnerability. But within that vulnerability there's, there's an amazing peace in no longer having to support the stuff that they've taken in and held in tightly to try and be comfortable and make things secure on the inside. So, some of you people may choose to come and share with John, and others may or may not, or understand why to. That's fine. That's, in fact, that's perfectly fine. Because we couldn't fit him in this room. But we saw a lot of people here yesterday. I, I bowed away when uh, I was with my camera, uh, an interruption rather than just part of the, the scene. But um, I was and have been. Very happy to have met you. I hope to come to your audience here again. Um, is there anything that you would like to specifically say to our audience or share something that you feel encapsulates what you'd like to deliver? To sum it up, um, the, the only thing that works, that makes one alive, genuinely alive inside, is to allow there to be an absolute and a complete, without any conditions attached to it, an honesty of heart that addresses not surface issues of a person's life, but addresses the very, the very core of one's consciousness, the very core of a person's being. And that honesty allows you to see what is really true, and then that can be followed by an unconditional surrender to what is actually recognized or realized as true and everything that's realized that was that had to be held together, that had to be pulled together by a belief system or a moral structure, that all of the energy that goes into that, that one can finally let it go because that doesn't enable one to live. That just takes your living space inside and makes it really small. It's just an actual, just a clear honesty of heart and then a surrender to what you realize is being true and not pulling back from that because it may change your whole life. Mm -hmm. It may affect your ego. It may affect your relationships. It may affect your way of being in the universe so far. A way of being that's, that's based on coping and controlling. That's all our human personalities really know how to do, I think, isn't it? Um, you know, one thing that I really wanted to bring up <clears throat> for the people here, because for me it was a big one when I listened to you the last time you were here, and that is your concept of dealing with pain or illness. Um, because everybody's always looking to make it better, and to get rid of the pain, and to make their lives better, to make their health better. Um, would you talk about 
talk to um, our beloved people out here a little bit about your concept. How do you deal with pain? About how to deal with pain, yes. That whatever is presently uncomfortable or whatever is presently painful to respond to that pain or that discomfort or that mental or emotional or physical not okayness um, to let go of ever needing for that to change to let go of wanting that pain to go away wanting that discomfort to go away and to let in an absolute and a complete acceptance of what presently is so if there's mental or emotional or physical pain, if a person is in depression, then that depression is finally allowed to be just what it is. And there's no effort to try and change the depression first or to change one's physical existence first or to change one's mental reality first before you can settle and be okay inside. So that okayness is, is no longer dependent on feeling okay physically or emotionally or mentally. So if someone's health was um, a problem for them and they needed to have surgery, would you say have surgery, don't have surgery? Because if you're having the surgery, it seems to me that you would be having the surgery to make it better. Then go ahead and have the surgery. Deal with your body in, in, in the most wonderfully shallow way of just simply favoring it and taking care of it, but not doing something like getting surgery or taking supplements or fixing your body or working out or, or eating right. <laughs> not not doing that as an effort to to be okay on the inside and that you can't be okay on the inside until the body is right. But it's having a profound acceptance of whatever part of the system, mental or emotional or physical, isn't working properly or doesn't feel good I am and allowing that to be what it is and then in a very wonderfully shallow way doing whatever you want to fix it but it's not fixing it to address the deep and the profound mm -hmm. that you can't be okay until the pain is gone I think that that's a really big lesson I know one of the things that I've worked with with uh, my teacher is that um, accepting the fact that everything is good enough to be God. In other words, for me, I mean, I always saw how I had a, a very distinct, this is good enough to be considered God. This is not good enough to be considered God. Like the pain would not be good enough to be considered God. And, and coming to allow that to be, is that what you're basically saying? If, if you cannot be okay in the midst of pain without condition, then you also cannot be okay in the midst of happiness. Because then when you are happy, you're always projected out and forward to see what is there out there that can take away or threaten my happiness because I really don't want that pain. So if you can't be with pain, you also can't be with joy. Because as soon as there's joy or happiness, then you're always relating to what it is that can take it away from you. What is the threat? Who is the threat? I'm the threat. I'm going to take it away from you guys. Oh, no, don't do take it away. <laughs> for a long time. But we have a limitation here, see? We're in a limited medium. If we had more time, we'd love to have you with us. And we only share. think we're in a limited <laughs> medium. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, uh, I know that many of you have found this to be a new world one that is opening you in new ways that will want you finding to explore more within yourself and in getting together with John. John is here in the month of June, which is where we are now. But if you'll snap your fingers, the year will progress. And uh, John is going to be coming back to Maui from October 12th to 16th. And many of you have interest and in, uh, would like to be able to share more with John. We also have a voicemail number for you here. Um, that is manned by Joy. Would you like to say Oh, anything? I do, of course. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm very excited and happy to speak with you. And I loved this opportunity. I really am very grateful to you for allowing yourself.
yourself to be present here with us and be present with these wonderful people out here who are watching this. One of the things that I love about our show is that we have the opportunity to touch people from all over the world. This is not just Maui, because people who are visiting the island from all over the world watch their televisions. Believe it or not, people watch television when they come to Maui and uh, get the opportunity to experience you and have their hearts opened in whatever way they do. Any other thing you'd like to say to these people before we uh, bid them a farewell? Don't take themselves seriously. <laughs> Don't take yourself seriously. Don't take life seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. The only thing that's worth taking serious is that the tiniest little bit of actual clarity that you have on the inside that allows there to be a newness inside instead of holding together something that's old and is always the same. We're not worth taking seriously. We're worth being gentle with ourselves, but not hard on ourselves. Thank you, John. Thank you. Great pleasure being here with you, Hub. Ariel? Thank you, John. You're a great hugger, too. <laughs> Thank and we thank you very much for joining us, and we, we hope it. that you will take the opportunity to be with John the next time he comes and see and experience this for yourselves. Uh, one other thing that I did want to add is that John's um, work is all on donation, and there is no charge for you to come and have this experience. Certainly, you can donate as you like to, but he feels that that's not part of his work, and I think that that's a very beautiful aspect of what he does. And just wanted to put that in there for you, so don't let anything stop you from coming and having this experience. God bless you. And don't have anything stop you from having another experience to come and visit us again, because we're also free. <laughs> we know that this medium bringing things to you is our gift. Aloha. 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 I thought it was a really nice interview, yeah. and I would have loved to done more. Obviously, I have many questions that I would love to go deeper into. I mean, there's many things that I would have loved to have brought up um, about your family, your children, your life as a man, you know, as, and how you fit your spiritual life into that.